Do something. Do something. Do something. That is the loudest refrain of demagogues in the wake of the tragic elementary school shooting in Uvalde, Texas. But what exactly are we supposed to do? This is Verdict with Ted Cruz. Today's episode of Verdict with Ted Cruz is brought to you by IP Vanish. Did you know that browsing online using incognito mode doesn't actually protect your privacy? Without added security, you might as well give all your private data away to hackers, advertisers, your internet service provider, and who knows who else. IP Vanish helps you securely and privately browse the internet by encrypting 100% of your data. This means that your private messages, passwords, emails, browsing history, and other information will be completely protected from falling into the wrong hands. IP Vanish makes you virtually invisible online. It's that simple. Just for Verdict listeners, IP Vanish is offering an insane 70% off their annual plan. That's like getting nine months for free. You have to go directly to ipvanish.com cactus to get this 70% off discount. IP Vanish is super easy to use. Just tap one button and you're instantly protected. You won't even know it's on. You can use IP Vanish on your computers, tablets, and phones. Whether you're at home or in public, don't go online without using IP Vanish. Don't forget, Verdict listeners get 70% off the IP Vanish annual plan. Just go to ipvanish.com slash cactus to claim your discount and secure your online life. That's ipvanish.com slash cactus. This episode of Verdict with Ted Cruz is brought to you by Genucel. How old does your mirror say you are? You can delay this question by five, 10, even 15 years with Genucel's new ultra retinol serum. You can, you know, see it sitting right here on the desk. Here's a testimonial from Marina. Marina lives in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. She says, great product. My skin loves it. I have spent more money, she says, on creams over the years, enough to pay off my house. Just kidding. But it feels like that. This product has changed my life like no other. Now, Marina is flying high with Genucel's new ultra retinal serum with hyaluronic acid. Um, this works to hydrate your skin at the cellular level. It builds on this deep moisture with incredible anti-wrinkle effects. And gentlemen, you know that we ladies, we wives, use your razors in the bathroom when you are not looking. Likewise, we know that you use our face products, our skincare products. And it's fun. All's fair in love and war. Now, if you go to my URL, that is genucel.com slash cactus, you can get up to 50% off Genucel's new ultra retinol serum. That is 50% off if you go to genucel.com slash cactus. It's spelled G-E-N-U-C-E-L dot com slash cactus. Genucel.com slash cactus. This episode of Verdict with Ted Cruz is brought to you by American Hartford Gold. Now, the new inflation numbers are out, and I think we can all agree they are incredibly depressing. The price of gas is way up. The price of housing is up. The U.S. national debt is way, way, way up. And unfortunately, given the way that our current administration prints money and spends money, experts don't see this going away, this inflation going away anytime soon. So how do you protect your money? your savings, your retirement from inflation. Well, when times are turbulent, Americans like you turn to physical gold and silver and American Hartford Gold can show you how to hedge your hard earned savings against inflation by diversifying a portion of your portfolio into physical gold and silver. And it's really easy to get started. All it takes is a short phone call and they will have physical gold and silver delivered right to your door or if you prefer inside your 401k or your IRA. They make it easy. If you call them right now, then they will give you up to $1,500 of free silver on your first order. So don't wait, call them right now. Call 855-768-1883. Or if you prefer texting, you can text the word cactus to 65532. Again, the phone number is 855-768-1883 or text the word cactus to 65532. Welcome back to Verdict with Ted Cruz. I'm Michael Knowles. Senator, everyone is debating, not not just the horrific incident that happened in Uvalde, the shooting at this elementary school, but it seems like from the very second that this happened, you had demagogues pushing their own pre-existing political agenda and, and yelling and saying, do something, do something, and mocking and deriding anyone who suggested that we ought to pray about this and we ought to let people grieve and mourn. Uh, you have not just been observing this from afar, you have been down in Uvalde. What have you seen? Yesterday morning, I flew into Uvalde. I went first to meet with the local leaders in law enforcement. Met with the mayor, met with the county judge, 
met with a sheriff who's absolutely distraught, met with Texas DPS and the FBI, the district attorney's office, uh, and the superintendent of, of the school board and the chief of the school police. Uh, and we, we started the day with, with about a two-hour briefing of what we knew at that point. You know, what we know is evolving. We know more today than we knew yesterday. But the shooter, 18 years old, as you know, in the morning got up and shot his grandmother in the face. And then he got in a car, a truck actually, her truck, and drove the truck just down the street. So, so her house is just a couple of blocks from the school, so he didn't go very far. And he crashed the truck uh, into a drainage ditch. And the drainage ditch goes down about six, eight feet. And I saw, I was at the school yesterday, I saw the truck, uh, which is still down in the drainage ditch. He had gone through a fence and down into the ditch and crashed there, broken the tires off the axles. And then he got out of the truck and it was right next to the elementary school. And he went into the elementary school. And the facts are still unfolding about when exactly law enforcement encountered him. Uh, what we were told yesterday appears to be different from what the facts are today, but he entered mm -hmm. the back door of, of the elementary school. And it was a door that's right next to the, the teacher's parking lot. And by all appearances, that back door was unlocked and he walked directly into it. Uh, he walked into it carrying a gun. He went down the hallway and entered a classroom. It was a fourth grade classroom. That classroom was adjoining to another classroom. So there were two classrooms that were adjoining, connected by a door in between. And he terrorized those children and executed those children. And law enforcement arrived. What they're saying uh, today, what, what DPS has said today, is that law enforcement arrived 12 minutes after he crashed the truck into that ditch. Um, and he barricaded himself into that classroom and a gunfight ensued. That gunfight lasted sometime anywhere between 40 minutes and an hour. And when I met with the FBI and law enforcement, they were reviewing the footage and they're trying to set the precise timeline, but it was an extended, it was a protracted gunfight. Uh, three law enforcement officers uh, were wounded, although thankfully none of them were seriously wounded. And I got to say all day yesterday, from meeting with the first responders to going to the school, uh, to seeing the, the, the wreckage firsthand, to going last night to a prayer vigil, you know, the community had a, a prayer vigil and it was packed. It was inside this, this uh, big indoor barn where they have bull riding and they have rodeos there. You know, Uvalde is a, a small town. It's in South Texas. It, it's a pretty rural town. Um, it's outside of San Antonio, but it's, it's, it's not a big city. It's not a big suburb. It is a small South Texas town. And the community is just shattered, is, is, the grief, the agony, you could see, you could see parents just, just in tears wailing. You could see grandparents, you could see students, high school students walking in with just this look of, of sort of glazed shock. You know, this was the first school shooting s since I became a parent. And obviously there have been lots in my lifetime when I was a kid, starting with Columbine and then so many, so many others, unfortunately, that have occurred. But this was the first one since I became a parent. And I, I didn't get it yeah. before I was a parent. And I, I, you would always hear people say, you're hugging your kid closer tonight. This is the worst thing you could possibly imagine. And I always thought, obviously, this is incredibly tragic. But what, what does that mean? You hug your kid closer because you just the, if you're if you are a parent, you just you think this is this is the singular horror that you can imagine. And it, it is in part why my reaction just to the 
the politics of it and the coverage in the media was a little different this time. I thought, can you can you let people mourn a little bit? Can you let people grieve a little bit? Can you just give it two seconds before this has to become some national debate on anyone's pet project? And I got to tell you, it's, it's frustrating for me because this is not the first time I've been on the ground where some psychopath has carried out an act of mass murder. I, I've represented Texas for 10 years. And we've had way too many of these. Santa Fe High School is less than an hour outside of Houston. When that lunatic began murdering high school kids there, I was at home. I got a call at home. I jumped in a truck and headed down to Santa Fe. I was there within an hour of when the shooting happened. Uh, Sutherland Springs is another small town, rural town outside of San Antonio. Worst church shooting in, in U.S. history. I was there the day after Sutherland Springs. I was in that beautiful little sanctuary when there was still blood and, and, and shattered glass, shattered iPhones, pews thrown in chaos as that lunatic executed people, including that lunatic executed a child that was 18 months old. He shot and murdered. I was there in Midland, Odessa with another mass murderer there. I was there in El Paso, Texas with another mass murderer there. I was in Dallas with another mass murderer who targeted police officers. There are broader causes that we can and should discuss, causes that we've seen, whether it's the destruction of the nuclear family, whether it is the loss of, 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 of strong and loving father figures in families. Many, if not most of these murderers come from a home without a strong and loving father. Uh, whether it is the deterioration of faith and community in a church life. And, and it seems almost all of these people are detached from their community. And there are lots of things that have nothing to do with government and policy that have led to angry teenage boys being filled with murderous rage. But what, what your political opponents are going to say is they're going to say, well, okay, yeah, enough. Well, do something about it. And I, I almost, I mean, I guess now th there is this national debate going on. And so it's been a couple days after this, this shooting and people are just going to be debating all of these policies. But uh, it seems almost tired at this point to recite the same old litany because it's the same old debate every time. But th the do something is not enough. And the proposals that have been made by the Democrats almost exclusively to regulate guns, none of them would have prevented any of these mass shootings. Even the Washington Post admitted that when Marco Rubio said it in 2015. Even the Post fact checker had to admit that that point was right. Then you, you get on to other proposals that could possibly even be made here. What would that be? To ban guns entirely? Well, you're going to run up against a constitutional problem, a practical problem. There are more guns than people in this country. There's no political will whatsoever to ban guns. And there's not a lot of evidence that banning guns would reduce the murder rate. When they banned handguns in the UK, the murder rate increased significantly. It almost doubled in about six years. So it, it's, this, it's the same old litany of issues. And I think, I, I think this is why the people who criticize thoughts and prayers and the people who say, well, do something, do something, it's why they don't tend to get very specific because they don't have any more of an answer on what to do than anybody else does. They're just demagoguing the issue and, and pretending that their sympathetic outrage is somehow productive. So, so let's assess, how do we stop these? Inevitably, when there's, a, when there's a mass murder, within seconds, Democrats and the media begin calling for the exact same policies they were calling for the day before, which, yeah. which their objective, and more and more the left is quite candid about it, is to disarm law-abiding citizens throughout this country, to take away your firearms, my firearms, and those of law-abiding citizens. There are many problems with that, but let's just start with a basic one. It doesn't work. Taking away every firearm that Michael Knowles owns would not have stopped this psychopath from murdering children in Uvalde. And by the way, we see that in Chicago and New York and DC and California where they have very strict gun control yeah. and the criminals still have guns and still carry out murders. If you could wave a magic wand and eliminate all firearms in America, there would be substantially more murders than there are today. 
I'll give you a, a statistic from the Obama White House. Now, the Obama White House is hardly a right wing source. Here's what the Obama White House concluded is that, is that firearms are used in the United States defensively between 500,000 and 1 million times per year. Yeah. Used to stop the commission of a crime. So if the left succeeds in taking away everyone's firearms, all of the instances, now that doesn't mean that there are between 500,000 and a million gunfights. Many, many times firearms are used to stop a robbery, to stop an attempted murderer, to stop a kidnapping where the gun isn't fired, but simply brandishing the gun causes the criminal to abandon the criminal effort. And that happens, according to the Obama White House, between 500,000 and a million times a year. So eliminating all firearms, I believe, would cause far more loss of life because it would mean that criminals would be able to maraud, would be able to commit assaults and not be worried about people defending themselves. And by the way, the data, if you look at the jurisdictions with the strictest gun controls, Almost without exception, they have among the highest crime rates and the highest murder rates. And places with lower rates of gun control, in other words, with more widespread firearms among the citizenry, you have typically much lower crime rates, much lower murder rates. But, but let's not skip this question. Is there something we can do to stop these? And I believe the answer is yes. When I first arrived in the Senate, I got elected in 2012. Just after I arrived, Sandy Hook, the horrific school shooting in Connecticut occurred. And so we had this debate 10 years ago. And when I looked at it, I said, then we need to do something. What do we need to do? Let's get the guns out of the hands of the violent criminals, the felons and fugitives and those with serious mental illness. And so I authored legislation. It was called Grassley Cruz. Grassley Cruz was legislation targeting the bad guys. And so one of the things it did is it improve the background check system. If you look at, we have a background check. So if you or I go buy a gun, you got to run a background check. It runs the check to see if you have a felony conviction. That database is only as good as the information in it. And a lot of the federal government has been lousy at reporting felony convictions to the database. And a lot of states, interestingly enough, many of them blue states, hmm have terrible records reporting the felonies to the background check database. If you look at Sutherland Springs, which was the church shooting in Texas, in that instance, that crime should have been prevented. Why? Because the shooter there, it was already illegal for him to buy a firearm. He was a felon and he had a domestic violence conviction, so it was doubly illegal. So why was he able to buy his firearm? Well, the reason is that the Obama Air Force never reported the conviction to the background check database. Hmm. So he went into a gun store to buy his gun. He filled out the background check form and he lied. They, he was asked, do you have a felony conviction? He checked the box and said no. He was asked, do you have a domestic violence conviction? He checked the box and said no. They ran the background check. And because the federal government, the Obama administration, never reported his felony conviction to the database, the background check came up clean and they sold him the firearm. So one of the things Grassley Cruz did is mandated the federal government, the Department of Justice, to do an audit of every federal agency to ensure that all felony convictions were in the database. It also provided funds for states to do the same thing for state convictions. But beyond that, every year there's a vast number of felons and fugitives who try to illegally buy firearms. The Department of Justice prosecutes almost none of them. In fact, I'll give you the stats from 2010, which was the last year there were stats from before when I drafted Grassley Cruz. In that year, there were 48,000 felons and fugitives who tried to illegally buy firearms, 48,000. Of those, do you know how many the Department of Justice prosecuted? 44. And, and by the way, that continues to this day. The Biden Justice Department still is not prosecuting felons and fugitives who try to illegally buy firearms. Grassley Cruz mandated the creation of a gun crime task force at the Department of Justice to go and prosecute and put in jail felons and fugitives who illegally buy firearms. Now, what happened to Grassley Cruz? We voted on the Senate floor on that bill. It got a majority. It got 52 votes in favor of it. Nine Democrats voted in favor of Grassley Cruz. 
got the most bipartisan support of any of the comprehensive legislation that was voted on. So why didn't it pass? Well, it was the Harry Reid Democrat Senate, and the Democrats filibustered it. They demanded Hmm. 60 votes. So even though I had 52 votes, we didn't have 60. And so it failed because Harry Reid and Chuck Schumer and the Democrats filibustered it. They're not really focused on this issue, right? They're they're focused on pushing the same legislation that they've wanted to push for decades now, and, and they'll use any circumstance to try to push that. But what we're seeing here in the specifics of this actual shooting is in some ways, it, it seems like it's a repeat of the Parkland shooting. You've got a kid who yeah. w- was showing serious signs of trouble. He should have been identified much sooner. He, there should have been safeguards placed around this kid much, much sooner. There are now questions about when law enforcement got there, if law enforcement did enough in the moment. Uh, you're, you're seeing, I'm not saying it's a repeat of history, but you're seeing lots and lots of similarities, none of which are addressed by the legislation that the Democrats are proposing. I sat down and participated in roundtables with the families of the victims who were murdered in Santa Fe, and it included families who were in Parkland, families who were in other mass shootings, and we talked about how do you prevent them. And as you talk to security experts, one of the things they said is for schools, many schools are very, very vulnerable, and there are concrete steps we can take to harden schools and make them safer. And in particular, here's what the experts have recommended. They've said, you don't want multiple means of entering the school. You don't want lots and lots of open doors. Um, If you look at how the shooter got in in Uvalde, he went into a back door that was unlocked. That's exactly how the shooter went in in Santa Fe, a back door that was unlocked. He was able to get in, and then he was able to get right into a classroom. Same thing in Santa Fe. So twice the same thing happened. What the recommendations were is have a single point of entry for the school, one door that everyone comes through. If you think about it, a secure facility, a courthouse, a federal building, they often have a single point of entry because from a security perspective, that's much safer. At that point of entry, The single most effective security step you can take is to have armed police officers there at that point of entry. Um, That has a greater impact on keeping kids safe than just about anything else you can do on on school safety. Funding for school safety should be a no-brainer. There's not a single Democrat who opposes it on, on principle, but every time I've tried to force a vote on it, Schumer has blocked it because his view is if he can't take away law-abiding citizens' guns, he's not willing to do anything. I hope after this that changes. But, you know, part of the problem, Michael, the press are active advocates and partisans. I've never seen one Democrat asked why they vote against and filibuster school safety funding, funds for police officers in schools, funds to put bulletproof doors and bulletproof glass in classrooms and and locks that, that an assailant can't enter the classroom. If this guy had entered the school and the school classrooms had been locked and he couldn't get in, he couldn't have murdered these children. Last night when I was at the prayer vigil, there was this British reporter, this, this kind of, you know, ran and chased me and stuck his TV camera in my face. And I'm walking out of the door. And, and at first he asked me about what we were seeing there. And I said, look, this is, this is horrific. This is their 19 sets of parents who are not going to be able to hug their child tonight or, or see their child. And it is, it's the most unspeakable evil we could imagine. And he immediately jumped into, well, don't we need to pass gun control? And I didn't want to argue with this guy and I'm disengaging. He's a British guy. He was an obnoxious leftist. And he's like, why does this only happen in America? Doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. It's only America. Why is American exceptionalism so horrible? The premise of his question is is factually false. And I actually, Newsweek uh, just published something, which which I'll point out. Um, I'm quoting from Newsweek. Um, that, that says since 1988, there have been a total of nine attacks similar to the Robb Elementary School shooting. Nine is nine too many. But once you adjust for population, there are many other countries from Germany to Russia to Finland that have comparable rates of school mm-hmm. shootings. And in fact, it goes in and it breaks down 
Uh, According to a Crime Prevention Research Center report from 2020, and this is a quote, the U.S. is well below the world average in terms of the number of mass public shootings, and the global increase over time has been much bigger than for the United States. And it goes on to say that, by our count, the U.S. makes up less than 1.13% of the mass public shooters, 1.77% of the murders, and 2.19% of their attacks. All of these are much less than the United States' 4.6% share of world population. Hmm. And it goes on to say, and again, this is a quote, out of the 101 countries where we have identified mass public shootings occurring, the United States ranks 66th in per capita frequency of these attacks and 56th in the murder rate. And on this issue in particular, the press is so wildly dishonest that I understand why people at home don't understand what to do about it. Most people at home don't know that that there are laws we could pass that would stop felons and fugitives from illegally buying guns and put them in jail, but the Democrats are blocking them. Most people don't know that. Most people don't know that the Democrats have been blocking more funding for school safety for years and the press will not report it. And and that's why things like this podcast, I I think, matter. If this show and other shows like it can do nothing else beyond break up what is an extremely dishonest uniform narrative, that could be politically quite productive. Now, this isn't this isn't the only venue on which uh, you can discuss these sorts of things. As you know, uh, you, Senator, and you all uh, of you out there in podcast land, there is another series where you can go even further. If you are a Verdict Plus subscriber, that is uh, The Cloak Room with Liz Wheeler. Liz, what will you be talking about? Hi, Senator. Hi, Michael. Unfortunately, we have to talk about Beto O'Rourke's shameful stunt at the press conference. Senator, you were there at the press conference um, when Beto interrupted Governor Greg Abbott. We're going to talk a little bit about that. We're also going to talk about the police response or lack thereof to this shooting. What happened? What went wrong? What uh, could have been done? What should have been done that could have potentially saved the lives of these children? Please join us for this important conversation on Verdict Plus. You can go to verdictwithtedcruz.com slash plus for this special episode of The Cloakroom. There is lots more coming up on The Cloakroom and of course uh, on the next episode of Verdict. So make sure to get your mailbag questions in. Senator, thank you very much. I'm Michael Knowles. This is Verdict with Ted Cruz. This episode of Verdict with Ted Cruz is being brought to you by Jobs, Freedom, and Security PAC, a political action committee dedicated to supporting conservative causes, organizations, and candidates across the country. In 2022, Jobs, Freedom, and Security PAC plans to donate to conservative candidates running for Congress and help the Republican Party across the nation. If you like this video, you should click the like button, and then you should subscribe, and you should ring the bell, and you will never miss another video.